Hi, I'm Kirk Granroth, and on today's episode of Granworks, I build this a dining table base, or more specifically, a 20th century industrial style trestle table base. <laughs> uh, stay tuned. In the beginning was this, a 20th century industrial trestle table from Restoration Hardware. We've wanted a larger trestle table for quite some time, but until we saw this one, we could never agree on what it would look like. Eh, this seemed like a doable design to start from. So I imported it into SketchUp as a photo match and started iterating from there. After some time, like a couple months, I had this. All the pieces were created as components, so it's easy to break out a cut list from that. And with that in hand, I went to my local hardware supplier and picked out 40 odd board feet of poplar. The big question was, could I haul all this lumber in my electric car? Yes. Yes, I could. Trivially, in fact. Hatchbacks are pretty sweet. Now, the look I was going for was along the lines of a reclaimed barn wood or some very distressed wood, but I found myself milling the stock to be pretty flat and square to get a consistent jumping off part. I started by edge jointing the pieces just enough to have a flat surface to register against my table saw fence. Nothing final at this stage. It's a good thing too, since my jointer was working pretty horribly right about now and it was incapable of giving me a flat final edge. You can see from the shortened progression that it was making the back half even worse than it started. More on that later. Now that the 8 quarter stock for the legs had one sort of flat edge, I could cut it in half to get my two legs. I have a mobile table saw base with locking rubber castles that essentially disintegrated this summer, and so you can see how much of the saw moves when using it. I finished this particular cut as is, but I just placed a bunch of weights in front of the base so it wouldn't move forward anymore. Every cut at this point is rough as I wanted to leave as much material as possible for final finishing and fitting. I tried to get a close to final edge on the leg, but as you can see the face simply wasn't flat enough and my edge ended up being pretty far off from square. These boards were notably bowed and cut, and so I decided to use my thickness planer to get one flat face. And that worked reasonably well. I was also very happy to see my new dust shroud in action since it almost eliminates the staggering amount of sawdust created by a planer. That was well worth the money. And here's where I came to almost a full stop since I couldn't get my jointer to work properly. Here's a test piece where I marked a consistent one quarter inch line along the bottom and planed away at it with multiple passes over the jointer until the front was flush. Note how the back was almost entirely untouched though. It was very frustrating and brought me to a standstill for about a week. I decided to just buy new blades and set up the jointer from that reference. To do that, I bought a dial indicator with a magnetic base along with the new blades. I did not buy one of those jointer pals yet because I figured I could just use a magnetic torpedo level that I had on hand. It was tedious and something I'd never done before, so I'm just showing a tiny snippet of the process. I don't want to be thinking that this is the right way. My goal is to just get the dial indicator to register as close to zero on both the outfeed table and the blades, and it did in the end. And yeah, this completely fixed my joiner issue. With the now square and flat edge on the legs, I proceeded to plane them down to their final thickness and cut them to the finer width, registering the jointed edge with my fence. My bottom stretchers were both slated to be 3 quarter inch to 1 inch, but I had miscalculated when working out how much lumber I needed, and what I had available was 8 quarter stock. That did give me an excuse to use my bandsaw with a riser block and resaw blade installed to resaw the lumber to size. This was my first notable project I used my bandsaw, other than the fidget spinner I helped my son with previously. I wasn't looking at super precision at this point, so I didn't use a fence of any kind and just guided the board through by hand, eyeballing the line. After cutting the bottom stretchers to rough width, I attempted to smooth them with a hand plane. This was mostly to get more practice with bench planes since I have almost none. My goal was to get it to be roughly straight across, and if it's smooth, well, that was just a bonus. Then it's the standard edge jointing and thickness planing to get something resembling standardized boards for the bottom stretchers. The bottom and top width supports are identical pieces of 8 quarter stock. The two on top end up supporting the tabletop, while the two on bottom become the legs. I was getting into a groove at this point with the rough length, then edge joints, then final width, followed by final length. Both the top and bottom width supports have curved ends. The actual curved diameter doesn't really matter at all, so I went looking for an existing circle that looked about the right size. Turns out, the end of a shop vac attachment was perfect. Actually cutting out the curves made me very glad that I got my bandsaw in working order. A combination of this plus the resign I did earlier was the driving force behind me fixing the bandsaw in the first place. This is the one cut that I'm not sure how I would do it without the bandsaw since it's too thick for a jigsaw, 
Maybe just aggressive continuous sanding? This did remind me that I need to buy a quality 3 8 inch blade for non resign work though. The bandsaw left a pretty rough edge that need to be sanded smooth. The ideal tool for this would be any one of the vertical sanders, but uh, I have none of those. And so I just use my old standby of the belt sander. It works, just gotta be careful not to go too far. The top is going to weigh over 100 pounds, so the legs need to be very sturdy. The connection between the horizontal supports and vertical leg piece then needs to be as secure as possible. I chose half lap joinery for the task since its excessive amount of glue contact area combined with the ease of constructing it make it kind of an ideal combination. I wanted as clean a fit as possible, and so that meant as little measuring as possible. Instead, it was a case of using the pieces themselves to figure out what I needed to cut. The bulk of the dado is cut using a standard table saw blade. I didn't use a router or my dado stack because the dado needed to be over 1.5 inch deep. I'm not comfortable going to that depth with either of those. No big deal. I just nibbled away at the dado a tiny bit at a time. That got rid of the bulk of the wood, and most of the rest clears out quickly with just the claw part of a hammer. Any remaining bits are trivially cleaned out with a chisel. I needed the chisels for some fine tuning of the width as well since I wanted to ease into the perfect fit. At this point I did a dry fit of the pieces so far and I'll have to admit that it was a very satisfying feeling since this was the first time that my previous rough lumber started to actually look like something. Sweet! The bottom stretchers were done earlier, and now I got around to creating the top stretchers. These two both came from the same board of very wide rough poplar. I cut the rough length, and then cut the board in half. This was done at least partially to minimize the cupping action found in the wide board. That done, I made sure each piece was cut to the rough width. The now skinnier boards had far less of a cup than the wide one, but there was still a little bit, so some face jointing was definitely in order. After that, it was the standard pass through the thickness planer and then back on the table saw to rip the final width. Uh, I'll have to admit that these particular boards came out darn near perfect. It was almost a shame that I was going to be thoroughly roughing them up later and so this pristineness would never be seen. All four stretchers were cut to the exact same length at the same time. The plan calls for a half inch blocks under the bottom supports and so I got a piece of leftover four quarter poplar and resawed it in half. Those pieces went, went through the table saw for rough width, but I didn't want to measure for the final width, and so used the actual leg support to set up a stop block on my crosscut sled. But it wasn't until after I did that that I realized that I didn't actually want the blocks to be the exact width quite yet, since they were likely to move around during the glue up. So during the glue up, I just rotated them so my carefully stop blocked exact width ended up being the length of the block, and thus a dimension that didn't matter at all. After the blocks dried, I did the majority of making them flush to the supports with my belt sander, and for some of the blocks, I did 100% of the job with the sander. But for a couple of them, I decided to use my bench plane just to see how it would work, and if it would make a cleaner and more seamless surface. Maybe? I mean, it didn't matter how smooth it was because of the further distressing, but I guess it was nice getting a little bit more practice in with the hand plane. And here's where I glued the legs together, a decision I actually ended up regretting. And here's a lesson learned. If you are making this table using my sketch of plans, then do not glue together the legs at this stage. It will make a number of future steps harder, including finishing and attaching the stretchers. Just clamp them together at this stage. Note that I didn't use any fasteners on this stage. The surface area of this half lap is easily enough to hold the top using just the glue to hold the leg together. All of the wooden parts on the table base were now in their final widths, length, and thickness, and so I eased all the edges using a block plane and a sanding block. I'll reiterate that some of these boards just looked and felt so nice at this stage. By far the nicest boards I've ever milled up. I keep stressing that because in a few seconds, you're going to see how brutally I treat these boards. The goal for this table was always for it to have a somewhat industrial feel in the sense of being beat up and used looking. My pristine milled poplar boards are far from that. So quite a bit of the work done on this table face, in fact, the majority of the work, was related to getting it to the look I wanted. 
I wanted the boards to have a sense of a deeply ridged grain plus slashes and dings potentially suffered over years of use. The start of that was using a coarse wire wheel cup brush on my angle grinder. The idea was to follow some of the existing grain lines to accent them and then to dig in some new artificial ones. Poplar has wildly varying density depending on if it's heartwood or sapwood and so sometimes the wires dug into the board greedily and sometimes they just skip across the surface. This was partially irritating and partially handy as it did contribute to the essential randomness of the process. Before all this, I had experimented with other distressing techniques. This included a stiff steel wire brush by hand, a fine wheel cup brush, and a fine wire wheel for my drill. None of them really gave the deep grooves that I was looking for. Using the wire brush by hand was particularly ineffectual as it barely registered on the softer parts of the woods and did absolutely nothing visible on the harder parts. The two fine wire wheels did have an effect, but not necessarily one suited for what I was looking for. This is where I first regretted gluing the leg assemblies together. It made it impossible to bring the fake grain lines all the way up to the posts and so yeah, if you look closely at the finished product, you can see where the distressed marks abruptly end. I mean, nobody will ever look at that, but I know it's there. That would have been trivial if I had left the glue until later. Just saying. 90% of the visual part of this is face grain, so that's where the distressing is concentrated. The end and side grade both reacted very differently to the cup brush. The end grain required an exceedingly fine touch, as the brush dug into it like it wasn't even there. The side grain just kind of spewed up tons of fluff with uh, very undefined edges. The next step was applying the base coat of stain. I used Minwax Classic Grey, which is supposed to give it the look of weathered board. Well, definitely not on its own, at least with poplar, but it does make a good base for a weathered look. I just applied it to the stretchers and legs using a foam brush and let it sink in for eh, 10 or 15 minutes before wiping off any excess with a rag. The combination of having very thirsty poplar with distressed groove patterns mixed with the 105 or so degree temperatures in the shop meant that there was almost no excess to wipe off. I think I switched to wiping off the excess much quicker the farther along in the process I got, like maybe after 5 minutes or even after I was done with the board, I, I kind of forget. And now a word about this video's sponsor. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This channel is nowhere near big enough to have a sponsor. Okay, for real, now we're onto the faux painting technique that gives this the actual weathered look. I got the idea for this technique from some video I saw on YouTube, but uh, I'm currently forgetting where. I'll put a link in the doobly-doo when I find it. It starts with a fresh coat of gray stain. The goal for this layer isn't to soak in the wood at all, but rather to be an oil-based pigment that mixed with the later water-based colors. I apply a fairly thin layer and then immediately wipe off most of it. I found that if I left all of it on, then the end result would be eh, a little too muddy looking. But if I didn't use it at all, then the later layers would be just far too harsh. This very light layer hit the sweet spot. The next layer is a latex paint wash. I made it by combining a couple of a tablespoons, give or take, of white paint with a cup of water and mixing together. I ended up using a primer for this because, well, that's what I had on hand, and it did work, but honestly, a thinner latex paint would probably have worked even better. The wash is applied to the stain layer using a super cheap chip brush. A good brush would have had far too regular bristles that were far too close together. I mean, they're, they're made to look nice. I didn't want them to look nice. A cheap chip brush now creates an almost instant random pattern with the wash. I cover the side entirely using the wash and then immediately start wiping at it with a rag. The oil-based stain and thoroughly water-based wash don't entirely mix, and so the end result at this stage is sort of a lighter gray, slightly mottled coat. The final coat is undiluted white paint applied using a so-called dry brush technique. I use another chip brush, but this time I dab just the tips of the bristles into the partially dried globs of paint on the lid of the can. It's then very lightly and quickly spread on the board following the grain, sort of. The paint doesn't really flow at all and the brush dries out almost instantly. This might be due to the 100 plus degree temperature in the shop or it might be due to the dry brush technique. Maybe a little of both? And that's it for the various layers. What's left is the artistic part. I take my rag and start rubbing off the finish to whatever degree looks and feels right at the moment. The top layer of paint is almost certainly dry at this point, so it almost flakes off. The wash and stain layers are a little dry and a little still wet, 
Sometimes the rubbing just flakes off the top layer and leaves the bottom too intact. Sometimes it goes all the way down to the bottommost layer, which is kind of a grayish brown tinge. I didn't really have a formula to all this, since I was going by eye and by accident, and so each board had a very unique look. The amount and depth of the grooves made a huge difference in what it looked like too, and since each board had a different groove pattern, well, there was a difference right there. After this all dried, I put some 60 grit sandpaper onto a sanding block and randomly hit some of the parts. This is more of that kind of artistic part of the look, since just varying the pressure of the sanding block could dramatically alter the end result. The sandpaper would also not get into any of the grooves, so even a light sanding ended up exaggerating the white bits in the grooves. Uh, applying a harder touch would still leave the white in the grooves, but also sand the ridges down to a more brownish undercoat, creating even more contrast. Really, the idea was to just work at it until it looked like how I wanted it. And throughout the process, I kept in mind that I could just sand it down to bare wood and start over if I didn't like the end result. But I did like it, so <laughs> I didn't have to jump through that particular hoop. Th that was kind of lucky. With the pieces all full finished, it was time to assemble everything. The four stretchers are attached to the legs using bolts. That's purely for aesthetic reasons though, since this has sort of an industrial look. This step did remind me again that I should have waited to glue the leg assembly together though. My goal was to use two slightly smaller bolts in each of the stretchers, but that proved impossible for the upper stretcher. That's because I needed to drill a hole through the leg for the bolt to pass through, and the rigid support piece didn't give the body of my drill enough room to fit. The closest to the top I could get with my drill was roughly halfway up the side of the stretcher, so I had to make a last minute change of plans to use a single, thicker bolt for the top stretchers. I tried to line up the holes in the stretcher with the hole in the leg as close as possible, but apparently I was off by a little bit, and the bolt just wouldn't fit. I went at this with a combination of my Forstner bit and a longer twist bit to just get a clean hole all the way through. That did prove to be more of a pain than it looks, but uh, it worked in the end, so c'est la vie. There was still enough room on the bottom for two bolts, and so I kept with that theme there. I started by using my scratch awl to mark exactly where I needed to drill so my holes would be consistent. The first drill bit was my Forstner bit, which is the same diameter as the bolt, and I only drilled through the stretcher. That's because I wanted the bolt's threads to not catch at all in the stretcher and only bite into the bottom leg support. I then followed up on the Forstner bit with a twist bit that was properly sized to be a pilot hole, and my typical depth gauge. That done, the lag bolts are inserted and I just temporarily ratcheted them into place. I say temporarily because the shiny metallic finish on the bolts don't at all fit with the rest of the table's look. I wanted them to be black. I first created a simple spray platform by drilling some holes into the end of a cardboard box. The bolt and washers are then inserted and given three or four light coats using Rust-Oleum spray paint. I just followed the instructions on the can for how long to wait in between. Now notice the spray handle I have in the can in these shots. I see people still pressing the button on the spray can in this day and age and I don't understand why. These handles make it so much easier to use spray cans that I would almost think that they would be mandatory at this point. Anyway, after the paint dried I just installed the bolts permanently and that was it for those. And now for the final piece, the metal straps. I started by making a live mock-up of the straps using scrap pieces of wood so I could get the measurements right. I didn't really use my wood template as a true story stick as it's primarily used to get measurements rather than positions. After getting the measurements, I would then use them to mark off the place on the steel using my scratch awl and speed square. The straps are cut to length using a metal cutoff disc on my angle grinder. The straps need a hole for the bolt, so I start by making a small mark with my scratch awl and follow that with a small divot using a small twist bit. This is all just to give a place for the real drill bit to bite into so it doesn't wander. I use my drill press for this. All rough edges were ground away using a metal grinding disc, and the same is used to round over all the edges. It's funny that this is the third time I've used my angle grinder in this project, but the first time I actually used the grinder to grind something. Go figure. Now I should have done this step first. That is, clean the straps using some mineral spirits. There is a fine coating of some very dirty oil covering the metal straps when you get them from the store, and it sticks to everything as a pain to clean off. 
Better to just clean the strap to start and not have to deal with it later. Well, better late than never in any case. The straps need to bend in four places and my copious experiments over the months prior to all this taught me that cutting a deep score line is absolutely essential to making this work. So I scratched in a line in the same place for all the straps and then cut in the score lines using my diamond metal cutting disc. I used a diamond metal cutting disc rather than a typical cutting disc because I wanted the extra thickness. And honestly, wanted to see how well it worked since I just bought it. Yeah, worked just fine. I won't know if it's worth it until I use it for a while since it's notably more expensive than the disposable ones. But hey, so far so good. With the score lines, the straps actually bend super easily. Previous attempts without the scored lines required prodigious hammering with a mallet and you ended up with rounded corners. Like this, I could bend them by hand and the bends are super crisp. I took the angle measurements I had captured from my earlier wood template and locked them into an angle gauge. I used this to fine tune the bends to be precisely the same, well for at least the two inner angles. The two outer angles just needed to be parallel with each other and so I just did that by high. I fit the straps into place on the table frame pretty carefully using a combination square to get consistent placement. The straps are clamped into place and then I use a center punch to mark the exact location of the lag bolts. I didn't have any brad point bits at this point and so to ensure that I got a centered pilot hole, I first started with a countersink bit. This left a defined recess that the regular twist bit could easily follow. And then the bare lag bolts are inserted to make sure everything fits. Okay, okay, we're onto the home stretch now. The straps need to be spray painted black, but I didn't have an appropriate spray booth for that. So what I did was clamp a couple of rods to a random board outside my workshop, and then hang the straps onto that rod. Simple gravity and friction kept all four rods hanging in midair and gave me pretty decent access for spraying purposes. The ends of the straps are attached via lag bolts, but the part where the straps meet the leg post needed to be epoxied into place. I used a two-part five-minute epoxy, which worked fine, although mixing it on cardboard made it harder than it needed to be since the two parts looked identical with the brown background, and it wasn't super obvious when it was fully mixed. The epoxy was brushed on using one of those disposable horsehair glue brushes that you can buy at like 100 at a time. And yeah, I painted those lag bolts black just like the others. Now I swear, this is the final step for the table base. I don't mind the base getting more chewed up by actual use since that'll contribute to the look, but I didn't want it to get it bloated with water when some spills on it since, well, that will happen. So I decided to spray on a few light coats of a matte polycrylic. I have a Wagner HVLP sprayer, and yes, it's actually HVLP with a turbine and everything. I can handle pretty much anything I want to spray except for lacquer. That's why I used the spray cans earlier. I found from previous use that it really doesn't like clumps of anything though, so pouring the mixture through a filter is a must. I used a fine tip and a pretty concentrated spray pattern. It was notably difficult to actually see where I had sprayed, so yeah, there's a better than even chance that I might have missed some spots, or at least have inadequate coverage in places. And yeah, yeah, I know that my technique is atrocious. This is only the second time I've used an HVLP sprayer, so I clearly need more practice. Oh, and. Prior to spraying the polyacrylic, I did a bunch of searches online and found a huge number of articles and some videos claiming that it's either A, not possible to spray polyacrylic because it dries too fast, or B, it is possible, but you need to jump through a huge number of hoops. I'm not sure what those are talking about. I just filtered my polyacrylic and sprayed away without any special precautions and it worked like a charm. Seriously, I had no problems whatsoever applying several coats. I didn't even do anything special between coats, and there was nothing wrong with my spray gun. Cleanup was trivial too. It seems like polycrylic is kind of an ideal finish to actually spray with this. And that's it for the table base. I'm going to split this build into two parts, just because even this part is already getting really long, and the top took just as much time to build, if not even longer. I was worried about how it would look in the end quite a few times during the build but I'll have to say that I'm really digging the final look. The picture in my mind's eye was surprisingly close to the actual final piece. Cool. Well, stay tuned for the tabletop build video, and as always, thanks for watching.